Chapter 3. We need to send word not to execute the enslaver in high post. If his summoning circle is not found, it could be bad, very bad, said Norman to Lancaster in a serious tone. Not a problem. I will arrange a message. He calls forth a bird by reaching out of the balcony in his room and ties a small piece of paper to its leg. Best to keep it short, he says. I am sending this to Cayman, the chapel wizard of High Post. He'll know what to do. Meanwhile in High Post, the enslaver meets with a leather armor chested woman in the sewer system of town, carved out of the rock, her red hair stringy against her shoulders and a vine tattoo above her right eye. Her figure comely and beautiful, but her teeth fall down to fangs. That witch hunter will be here eventually, Miss Stryker. You had better have my back, said the enslaver, Fenros. I promise nothing, fool, but I will. You have my assurance, replied the woman. Darkin doesn't even know what he has under his very foundations. All is according to plan, the woman spout with glee. Two days later, Norman arrived in High Post, a town built on the edge of a forest cliff. He asked the first person he saw, a woman with tight pants and a white plush shirt, Where is the master of this town? Where does he reside? She then replied, Well, the people would have you believe it is King Hevar, but we all know that is a lie. Everyone knows he, take order, he takes orders directly from our resident wizard Darkin. He is in the tower close to the middle of the town. It was Darkin who defeated the dragon and saved us, or so they say. I don't believe it for a minute. Darkin wouldn't lift a finger to help his fellows. Norman crossed his arms and said, What if I told you that I defeated this dragon and, and not some wizard lord? The woman then replied, More believable than what I have to hear every day. She then smiled. One of his sigils then began activating, and he looked about with haste, ready to take on whoever or whatever was around. The woman looked with awe and said, What in the hell is that? Norman said, exactly. He walked toward the center of town, guarded as the sigil slowly unactivated. He noticed that it flickered, meaning a half-breed activated it. This could mean several things to him, so he was now on guard. What is the secret to his power? asked Fenros. Witch hunters use general magic, arts open to the public that aren't kept in the two great towers of Escadia and Mirak. Much of it is released by wizards, though hard to find. Others they acquire through defeating and killing those involved in the dark arts. They are cunning to be sure, said Miss Straga with an almost respectful tone. It is then that she caught a glimpse of a small orb of energy barreling toward them. Just as she dodged it, it arced into a thin beam then exploded into a swarm of insects. The woman then spout fairy wings and cut the swarm down. So you are a succubus, then, the abomination spawned through the union of a fairy and a dragon. Norman said, sure of himself, yes, you got me. I am this buffoon's willing little whore. We have a lot of fun in the late hours of the night if you catch my drift. She replied sarcastically. I don't care, replied Norman. In her brilliant burst of intense light, the succubus exploded with energy, blinding Norman. Quickly, Fenris, let us go now exclaimed the succubus. Norman held his hand and arms against his face, but to no avail. They were gone, and when his vision returned, he learned they had sealed the only way out of the sewers. He would have to find a new way out, and risk delving deeper into the dark. He lit his travel torch and moved on. After a long distance down the dank, dark sewers, and the wall was broken and inside was a light, what appeared to be a candlelight. He crept inside to find a makeshift room with a table with scrolls and books and a few magical ingredients, a skull and an hourglass where the sands fell upside down, and candles on the edge of the table, and some on a large metal pipe that popped out of the wall and back in. He took the hourglass, and since the sigil for cursed items did not activate, he knew it was safe and placed it in a large satchel. Just then an imp appeared before him as he turned to leave the room. Remember me, master? The imp snarked. Yes, I do, Norman replied, still distrustful of the creature. The imp then said, Do not be so serious, sir. I merely followed you here. My master wish, 
me to look out for you, so I did. It is only a matter of time now. Master will use a location spell to find us here. I am never outside of the of the tower for this long. Norman then says, I am relieved to hear that, but we have issues here in this town now. A succubus is up there with her enslaver, and there is no telling what they plan to do. In Lancaster, it is a normal still night. As the storms have died down, a member of the militia is smoking his pipe and eating bread as he peers off into the distance and sees a dragon flying toward the town. Running from his post on the high barracks, he yells, Archers to war! There is a dragon coming, all able-bodied men to arms now! The dragon's voice crackles like thunder in the distance, its wings bending trees like hurricane winds. It flies over Lancaster Tower. He sees, and he sees it and grabs his staff up against the corner behind his door and runs toward town. It lands outside the gate and smashes it down into pieces, snarling and waving its head back and forth. The archers take position. Lancaster yells, It is an, it is an opak dragon. It has no scales. Fire at will. Just then the dragon charges the group of archers like a bull, people running into their homes, others running from the town toward Lancaster's tower, and to the west and to the deserts. The dragon roars so loudly it disorients everyone, including Lancaster. He uses his staff to fire volley after volley of fireballs at the dragon, burning it badly, and it cannot advance, roaring in pain. The archers fire away one after the other, but the dragon roars very loudly again and the men cover their ears as it shakes them badly, and just as they do the dragon rushes them, taking fire still, and grabs one up with his with his huge jaws and slams him down on the ground, its bottom jaw also hitting the ground as dust fills the air. The dragon swings its rather large tail, thick at its base with a few scales on the top of its tail line destroying wooden columns in the very foundations of houses in its wake. Lancaster, fearing for his people's safety, but suspecting that the dragon is doing this against its will, he improvises. He starts to wave his hand in a wax-on, wax-off motion, chanting spells and speaking in some unknown language. After about a minute of this, the dragon is still destroying but not targeting anyone specifically. It suddenly lets out a small, long roar, then stands still. It then calmly starts picking the arrows in it out of its mouth, leaving a few in. It flies off, dust kicking up everywhere. The men cough and start to cheer for Lancaster. They notice the militiamen down on the ground, dead, with large teeth marks in his chest. It pierced right through his soft armor. The men and I will give him a proper funeral, sir, said Captain Reese. Lancaster clenched his staff hard. These are troubling times we live in. If only there were a way to root out all these enslavers before more innocent men fall to this evil.